so glad that you guys are here again. Uh, <laughs> we're in the midst of a series titled Galatian, Galatians, Heaven's Freedom. Uh, we've been talking about the book of Galatians, which Paul wrote. And the whole gist of it was to talk uh, about what Paul talked about to this church in Galatia, um, which is how to live in the grace of God. Because once we live in the grace of God, we're then living in heaven's freedom. So if you've missed any of the past sermons, I don't have time to recap tonight. We're going to jump right into chapter 6. But Paul, again, the entire point of this book is to get us to live in heaven's freedom. And then when he starts chapter 6, he says something in the first verse that has to do with, okay, now you're living in heaven's freedom. Here's something that we need to do as followers of Jesus Christ, living in the grace of God, i.e. heaven's freedom. And it says this, live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore them, saving your critical comments for yourself. A miracle took place when, uh, when I opened up Galatians 6 and read that first verse. And uh, it's a small miracle. I actually only have a one-point message tonight. And for those of you who come around, I usually have like a three- to four-point message, something like that. I got a one-point message tonight, friends. That's a small miracle. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. But it's going to be a good one. And I think every single one of us in this room is going to be challenged by it, but challenged in a good way. So are you ready? Are you ready to be challenged and stretched tonight? Yes. And encouraged and strengthened and all those other things that go along with it. But are, are you okay with me just being pretty open and candid with you all tonight? Yes. You okay with that? Okay, well, let me pray just in case you aren't. <laughs> Father, I thank you so much for this word. Jesus, thank you for the Bible. But more importantly, thank you for you. And thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I just pray right now that you would touch every single person's life in one way, shape, or form tonight. No matter what I say, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to every single person in this room personally tonight through this message. And we all together said, amen. amen. My one point is simple. is this. We have to learn how to love and forgive people who don't deserve it. <laughs> you know why this is so awesome? This is so awesome because it's impossible. <laughs> this is impossible apart from the work of the Spirit of God in your life. I promise you. Have you ever met anybody? Have you ever dealt with people? Come on, somebody. You were all raised by a human being, weren't you? Come on. Loving people that don't deserve it is impossible apart from the spirit of God at work in your life, which is what chapter five was about. We talked last week about how to be led and follow the Holy Spirit. And then it came down to three points, which I'm gonna get back to a little bit later. But I wanna say something tonight, and I'm gonna get in your stuff a little bit uh, because I'm still slapping the religion out of some people in here, you know? We've, <laughs> we're just gonna keep going until the religion is out of this place and we're totally free in here of religion because religion is cruel. Come on, somebody. Some of you grew up in religion and didn't do a dang thing for ya, right? right. So here's what I'm gonna say. And, and this is something that I've... I've come to grips with this in my life. It took me about 35 years to get to this point. But here's what I've become convinced of. We're all messed up. We're all messed up. <laughs> She's like, amen. Thank you. You're not religious. Thank you for being truthful. Listen to me. This section messed up. This section real messed up. That section completely messed up. <laughs> Yes, and I'm not even going to talk about the people in the cafe tonight, because they, they are so messed up, they won't even join us up here. Even. What about the guy up on the stage with the microphone? Everybody say it together. Yeah. Messed up. I'm your pastor. Don't say that. I'm messed up. We're all messed up. Amen? Amen. But here's the thing. We all need the same Savior. 
We all need the same Jesus in our life because we're all. Uh-uh. Nope. Some of you don't believe it yet. We're all. Thank you. So we need to stop with all the judgmentalism that we use towards other Christians. See, what it says in that first verse is that we are to, when someone falls down into sin, we are to forgivingly restore them. But here's, here's the issue that I have with this, and this is the one thing in Christianity that drives me absolutely nuts, bonkers, and I can't stand it, is that the very people who say that they're following Jesus Christ, when another Christian falls into a sin, we are the only army that will actually shoot at our own wounded. Here's what happens. Somebody falls down, and then other Christians, and you've seen this, they don't come to their aid to gently restore them in many cases. In a lot of cases, this does happen. But in a lot of cases, it doesn't happen. Christians are so quick to come alongside of somebody that just fell into sin and just to point it out, to say, I told you so. Because what does the rest of that verse say? It says, saving your critical comments for yourself. Listen, the church of Jesus Christ was never meant to be uh, a system where, uh, where we were just to enforce people to live by a set of rules. We were always meant to be an outpost of grace because grace transforms lives, friends. Jesus Christ, there is no prescription. Here's what happens in religious churches. They make it all about you and what you need to do to get your life cleaned up. And listen to me, I just talked with a young lady before service who's struggling with some stuff and I said, listen, don't try to clean yourself up because it won't work. You come to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit clean you up. That's the only thing that's going to work. And, and here's what the church needs to stop doing altogether. Because the, the church loves to try to be sin sheriffs. <laughs> running around handing out sin citations to people. Oh, you, 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 you sinned last week? Well, come here real quick. Let me write you a little prescription, a one, two, three process of how you're going to get better. And we're going to change your behavior a little bit. And then you can show up next week. And then maybe you can be in our club when you get all better. Listen to me. There is no prescription that will fix you. There is only a savior. That's the whole point of what we talked about this entire book. Listen, Romans 7, we went over this last week. Here's what Paul says. He says, man, I try to be spiritual, but I'm not. Man, I try to do things God's way because I really, 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 really love God. I love all of his commands. I love everything about him. I try to do my best, but the very things that I want to do, I don't do. And the very things that I don't want to do, I end up doing those. And it gets so complicated. And, and, and just when I'm trying to do good with my life, sin is right there to trip me up. And then he says, I don't know what to do. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there not an answer? And he answers the question. He says, there is, thank God, an answer. And his name's Jesus Christ. And he paid for all of your mess. He paid for your mess so that you could turn your mess into a message. Have you, have you ever heard that? And then he goes on to say this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. Well, if there's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ, why are Christians so condemning? Amen. Listen to me. God has no favorites, friends. You're his favorite. I'm his favorite. The crackhead down the street is his favorite. The drunk is his favorite. The crack addict is his favorite. We are all his favorites in here tonight. God loves you right where you are right now, but he loves you too much to let you stay where you are. He's trying to pull you in, a, in, a, in, a, in his direction. The whole goal of the Bible is that we are to be more and more and more like who? Like who? Yes, like Jesus. So if we're supposed to be more like Jesus, and in this scripture that tells us we are to forgivingly restore people who fall down, that should be our first act. It's interesting. He starts off Galatians with grace. Chapter six starts off with grace. Chapter six ends with grace, which we're gonna end on some grace next week. And I'm gonna just keep hammering this home because all the... <laughs> All the religion up in here is going to go. We're going to get it all out of here, and people are, start, are going to start getting really, really free in here because that's what God wants for your life. 
And if you'll just passionately pursue Jesus Christ, if you'll come to him, you'll just commit to following him with the rest of your life, he will change you in the process. Because you can't change yourself, friends. You all know this? You all know this? So if we need to become more like Jesus, how did Jesus deal with this? Did Jesus forgivingly restore people or did he come at them with critical comments? By the way, the only critical comments that Jesus gave out in the gospels was towards religious people. For everyone else, no critical comments. Think about the woman caught in adultery. We talked about this passage of scripture a couple weeks ago, but think about it. When, when everybody's ready to, to kill her, Due to the, the Mosaic law, she just got caught in, in adultery. They, they bring this woman before the crowd and they got stones in their hands. They're ready to kill her people. Do you know what they were saying? Do you know what people who were gonna kill somebody were probably saying? You slutty whore. Did I just say that in church? Yes. Because listen, think about it. They're gonna kill this woman. What do you think they were saying? It was vulgar. It was disgusting, horrendous. You deserve to die, woman. And Jesus confounds them. They bring them to Jesus and say, what do we do? According to Moses, we gotta kill her. And he says, anybody without sin be the first to throw. And we know what happens. All the stones drop. Everybody walks away. Jesus comes to her, looks at her in the eye and says, woman, where are your condemners? She says, I don't know. I don't see them anymore. And he says... Yeah, they're gone. Nor do I, the Son of God, condemn you. Now look, listen to me. He forgivingly restored her and then came at her with some truth. But stop sinning. You're better than that. This is why we have to err on the side of grace as followers of Jesus Christ. If you err on the side of grace, people will be willing to listen. That's better than you guys are sitting there. You look. Are we good? Yeah. Say amen, I'll move on. Amen. All right. Okay, you're gonna be like that? Okay. Uh-huh. All right, cool. Here we go. Uh, let's, let's think about another story. What about, um, what about Lazarus? My man was so messed up, he couldn't breathe anymore. Because he was dead. Okay. Jesus comes to the tomb and ruins his funeral. Does he not? Lazarus, Lazarus, get your dead butt out of here. Wake up. Amen. Comes back to life, restored, literally restores this guy to life, which is exactly what happened to every single one of us when we got born again. Amen. Lazarus, come on out. Lazarus comes out of the tomb, restores him. What about, what, about, uh, what about Peter? What about Peter? Peter comes to Jesus the night he's gonna be arrested and he says, Lord, I will follow you anywhere. I'll follow you all the way to my own death. And Jesus is like, what? Are you serious? You really think that? Huh? Well, I'm gonna tell you something, Peter. You're gonna be famous for your failure because here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna have three opportunities tonight to claim that you are one of mine, that you're my follower. I'm gonna give you three opportunities tonight and all three times, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna deny me. And he says, Lord, no, I'll never. I will never do that. We all know the rest of the story. He did that. Was so ashamed, was so guilt-ridden, was so upset with himself that he, I don't even think he was at, I don't think in the gospels we even see him at the crucifixion. He split was so ashamed, he went back to fishing after he said, I will follow you no matter what. He went back to doing what he used to do. Remember in this, in this Galatians series, we talked about not going back to the old way of doing things. Peter went back to the old way of doing things. After the resurrection, Jesus shows up on the beach, tells him, cast your net over there. They get this big catch, and, and Peter comes up onto the, onto the shore, you know, and, and he's talking to Jesus, and here's what Jesus does. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, of course I do. All right, well, I want you to feed my sheep. Well, Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he restores him 
forgives them, doesn't even say, listen, if anybody had the right to say, I told you so, and start with some harsh, critical comments, Jesus was the one. He could have said some stuff to Peter right there, and instead, he forgivingly restores him and says, you're gonna be CEO of the whole thing. Come on, bro, follow me again. That should give us all hope because we fall down, we mess up. But Jesus is not condemning you. He is not throwing critical comments towards you. He has forgivingly restored us once and for all. Listen to me, Romans 5, 8 says this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Listen to me. While we were still messed up, Jesus paid the bill. While we were still messed up. What about, what about the, the prodigal son story? Y'all know this story? This is a good one. This young man comes to his dad, basically says, dad, I wish you were dead. I want your inheritance now. That's literally what he was basically saying. I could care less if, uh, if we have a relationship. I'm gonna end the relationship right now by asking you to give me my inheritance right now. So the dad willingly complied. That's love, that's grace. Divides up the estate between that brother and his older brother. This one takes his share of the money. He goes off, spends it. He's crazy living. You know, he's, he's, he's messed up in a, in a life of complete ungodliness, spending his cash all over the place. He ends up in a pig pen, the worst place for a young Jew. And here's what happens. He comes to this moment. This is one of the most beautiful scriptures, I believe, in the whole Bible. It says, and then when he came to his senses, and, and another uh, translation says, when he came to himself, and realized, I am messed up, and I need a savior. And here's what he starts doing in this pig pen. He starts rehearsing the speech. He's thinking to himself, man, if I, I've, got, I've got slaves on my father's and servants on my father's uh, estate that have it better off than I do right now. I'm looking at the pig's food, and it looks good. So, so I, he starts putting this rehearsed speech together. I'm going to go back to my dad, and I'm going to say, Dad, I messed up, I've sinned against you, I've sinned against heaven, please forgive me. Would you just take me back as one of your, your hired servants? So he sets off, still messed up in the pig slop, the, you know, the, the, the pig pens, he's dirty, he's on his way back to the estate and this scripture I absolutely love because it paints a picture of the gospel for us better than any other parable in the Bible in my opinion. It says, while he was still a long way off, the father was looking for him, saw him, sets out and begins to run towards him, jumps on him, grabs him around the neck, starts kissing him. A second. Hold on. The son's the one who disgraced the dad. The son is the one who, who spent all his money. The, the son disgraced his father publicly in front of the entire community, and this father was still looking for his son, runs towards his son, arms around him, starts kissing him. The son then starts going into the speech, and here's, he's, he's going to go into the rehearsed speech, right? He gets to this point. And the dad completely ignores him, doesn't even let him get out any words. And he says, look, I want you to go get him, get him the best robe, get him a ring, put a ring on his finger, get him some sandals. You know, he wants to suit and boot his boy, right? You know, like, get him dressed nice. This is my son. And by the way, go kill, go kill an animal, this fattened calf. It was like the best piece of meat that they could ever have. And he says, we're going to have a celebration, play music. I want to dance. I want to party because my son was once dead, but now he's alive again. He's returned to me. Listen to me. The father representing your heavenly father had zero critical comments for this son. And by the way, the son was just trying to come back on as a hired servant. And the father said, uh-uh, you'll never be my servant. You're going to be my son. And there's nothing that you can do to earn it. Forgivingly restored him to a right relationship between father and son. It's no different for you and I. Jesus paid the price so that we could be in right standing and in right relationship with our heavenly father. Are you with me? 
2011. It was March. Um, what is that, four years ago? Over four? I had a really rocky relationship with my mom. And I've told this story public, publicly one time before, and it was at an all-access, but I've never shared it here. Um, I talked to my mom at my house before I left to come here tonight, and I said, hey, mom, I'm gonna share a story about you tonight if you don't mind. And, uh, and, and here's her response to me. She says, son, I want you to tell whatever it is that you need to tell as long as it'll help people. I said, mom, this is gonna help people. She said, I want you to tell it. She cried, gave me a big hug. Um, and why there were tears, you'll, you'll, you'll find out through the story why. But um, I had a, uh, a really rough, rocky relationship with both my parents growing up. My, my dad was gone. They divorced early, and um, my mom kind of turned to the bottle for... To deal with it, um, and that's just the way she chose, and it was year after year, and, and I won't get into all the details, but it caused a whole bunch of destruction in our home. My sister moved out um, when we were in high school. I stayed to take care of my mom because I feared for her life in many situations I won't go into, um, and it was just rough. It was, it was tough, and in college, you know, I was um, in the party scene, you know, and, and by the way, if you're here and you've been in the party scene any length of time, listen to me, you need to give Jesus just as much time as you gave the club, True. at least as much time. And I was out clubbing in college and I'd be out and I'd see my mom out there with random guys. And, uh, it, I mean, um, I can't tell you, you know, getting into fights with these guys. I mean, just alcohol-induced anger, rage, blah, 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 right? But you can just assume, and, and you can see why my relationship with her was basically nothing. And, and don't get me wrong, I'd see her at family events and family gatherings, family birthday parties and things like that, but I uh, despised, actually, uh, just even being around her. And so I didn't talk to her for almost 15 years. I had no real relationship with my own mother uh, for approximately, yeah, somewhere in there, 15 years-ish, uh, just based on how things went at home. And so uh, I was challenged by a mentor of mine because uh, at one of the meetings after I, after I gave my life to Christ in May of 2009, I had a spiritual mentor that kind of called this out in my life, you know, and, and asked about my relationship with my mom, and, and I told him uh, that I don't have one, and he said, man, I really think you need to forgive, and I'm like, uh-uh, no, I'm not doing it, man, you don't know what I went through, no way, there's no way that I can do that, and I remember leaving there thinking, you know, I love, I love this guy, I know that he's a godly man, I know he wants the best for me, but he doesn't get it, he doesn't understand, and, uh, Later on, it was like a week later, Resurrection Life Church, this church, is having their 2011 leadership conference. And I get a text from this mentor of mine uh, earlier in the afternoon, and the text said, hey, why don't you come tonight? There's a, there's a guy that's speaking, and I really think you're gonna be uh, blessed by it. And so uh, I talked to my wife, said, yep, I'd love to go to that. So I showed up, and there was a guy here speaking. His name was Rick Bizet never heard of this guy, have never listened to another sermon of his ever. Um, I heard one sermon from this man, and I was meant to be in the audience that night, you know, it was one of those nights, you know. And uh, so I showed up, and guess what he's talking about? To a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of leaders, he's talking about forgiveness, the very thing that I could care less to hear about right now, you know. And so as he started to talk, he, he, he called forgiveness a demonic spirit um, that leads to bitterness, that will ruin your life. And it destroys relationships, it destroys families, and he was right. And uh, I can't tell you a whole lot else about what he said that night. I, I, I took notes, I actually have it in a journal over there. Um, but I was so convicted by the Holy Spirit 
as he was speaking that I needed to call my mom that night. And that's all I knew. All I knew is that, number one, I had heard God speak. I had discerned that it was God. And then it was up to me now to obey the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, the fruit of the Spirit is on the other side of obedience to the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is on the other side of obedience to the Spirit. So now I'm sitting in this, in this congregation and all I know is that I gotta call my mom. So I get out, I walk outside to my car, I get in the car, I have my cell phone, and here, this, this should give you an idea of what my relationship with my mom was like. I had to call my wife to get my mom's phone number. Okay? So I called my wife, I said, Lindsay, I need my mom's number. Can you give it to me? She texted it to me. I called my mom, and right before I did that, I uh, was driving in my car, and, and I asked God, I said, God, what do you want me to say? How am I gonna do this? And all I felt like God spoke to me and said, I want you to ask her to forgive you first. I'm thinking, what in the world? Why in the world would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. But I felt like it was the Lord. So I, that's all I had. I, I called my mom up. I said, hey, mom, it's your son, Kurt. And... Uh, we had a little bit of small talk, and then I just said, Mom, I just need you to know something. I need you to, uh, one, I need you to forgive me for all of the things that I said to you in those moments that weren't so cute all those years ago. When things happen and all those things that I said to you uh, that were negative, that were dishonoring, I just, I feel horrible about it, Mom, and I'm asking you to forgive me. And uh, she says, no, 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 honey, I, I, I don't hold anything against you. And I said, okay, well, thank you, Mom. And then I said, but Mom, I also need to do something else. I need to, I need to let you know that God has amazing plans for your life and for my life. And I've been harboring unforgiveness towards you for years and years. And all I want you to know is that I love you and I want to be in a relationship with you. But I need you to know that I forgive you for everything. I don't any longer hold anything against you. I love you. And the, it was kind of silent on the end of the line for a little bit, you know, and I think she was teared up and, you know, it was, it was difficult and it was awkward and it was, it was hard. It, was, it wasn't all, you know sparks and you know it was it was hard and she just said son I just I think I'm gonna sleep better tonight and I said well that's good mom I just need I just needed you to know that you know and it it wasn't like a super spiritual moment but it was do you know what I'm saying it didn't feel like I was holier than that. It didn't feel like the, the spirit of the Lord just all of a sudden fell. No, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was just this little seed that was planted. Because God calls us to be peacemakers and he calls us to forgivingly restore. Now, James 3.18 says this. Those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. Now let me tell you what happened in that moment. A seed of peace and restoration was planted in my mom and I's relationship. And here's what happened. I have seen the goodness of God, the fruit of the Spirit in my mom's life. I've watched her grow and grow in her spiritual walk with God as I've grown in mine. And here's what happened. She turned her life over to God. On her 54th birthday, she went public with her faith and got baptized right here at this church. And just yesterday, I was sitting in Brent Knoth's, Knoth's <laughs> office. I'm sitting in Brent's office, our worship leader. And he says to me, he says, man, your mom 
is at church all the time now. I said, I know. I don't even know when she's there. She comes up in between services. I'm like, hey, mom, you know, what's going on? She is passionately pursuing Jesus Christ with her whole heart right now. Because, yes, because I was just obedient to what God asked me to do. <laughs> we make it so complicated. That's it. Galatians 6, 1, again, says this. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore them, saving your critical comments for yourself. One of the spiritual litmus tests for us as followers of Jesus Christ is whether, and, and whether or not we're actually being led by the Spirit of God, is this. Are we willing to forgive and restore broken people and broken relationships in our lives? And why is it so important that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, why is it so important that we do this? Well, number one, it's the way Jesus lived. First and foremost, it's how Jesus treated people broken, hurting people. He forgivingly restored them. He did not dish out critical comments to them. And here's the second reason, and this is so good. Paul gives it to us right after this. It says, because you might be needing forgiveness before the day's out. Come on, somebody. Is he telling the truth? Yes. <laughs> is he telling the truth? Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens and you will complete Christ's law. If you or I think that we are too good for that, then you and I are badly deceived. Come on, somebody. Is that a good word? Come on. Real simple. What is the Holy Spirit saying to each one of you through this message, through this word, through this scripture? Because every single one of us, I'd be willing to bet, every single one of us has at least one relationship. One person in our lives that we need to do this with that we need to reach out to, that we need to forgivingly restore that relationship because Jesus is all about relationships, amen? amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for showing us how to do it. Jesus, thank you for showing us the way. And if there's anybody in this room right now that's ready to follow Jesus Christ and be restored to a relationship with your heavenly father, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And listen to me, it has nothing to do with religion. He does not want to control you. He does not want to manipulate you. He wants to be your friend. He wants to walk alongside of you. He wants to empower you by giving you the Holy Spirit so that you can live this life completely free and live in heaven's freedom. And if that's you and you want to make that decision, it's really simple. God already knows that you're going to make the decision tonight because you're not here by accident. And if that's you, I want you to just shoot your hand up right now. Shoot it up in the air for me. God wants to see. I see it. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to be included tonight? Awesome. Let's pray with these, uh, these people that just made that decision. Let's just pray this prayer. You can put your hands down. Thank you. This is such a good moment. We can open our eyes. We can open our eyes. Friends, this is so amazing. People are about to get right with the Lord. This is so good. Let's pray a prayer together. 
It's real simple. Jesus just wants to come into your life so that you can be in a relationship with God. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray this prayer. God, thank you so much for how amazing you are. Jesus, come into my life and wreck it in all the right ways. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I submit and surrender to your leading the rest of my life. You are so awesome. And we pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Give him a big hand. Awesome.